for those of you who are just joining us, um, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Um, but at any time, if you have issues hearing folks, uh, whether it's me or Darlene or Kate, please let us know. You can either um, raise your hand or put a or just drop a comment in the chat section uh, to let us know. We're using um, different microphones tonight. So hopefully that will um, help with everyone hearing. Um, okay, I think we'll just get started. Um, if other people join us, that would be great. Um, but I just wanted to welcome you all. My name is Ned Puckner. I'm the Executive Director of Gallery North. I'm joined by um, Kate Schwarting, our curator, as well as Darlene Charnico, the featured artist in Evolving Perception. Um, tonight, oh, now my dog is barking. Hold on one second. <laughs> Right. Here we are once again. Um, okay, so before we start, I just want to uh, welcome you all. Um, and I'd also like to thank our sponsors uh, of this exhibition. They include Dime Bank, uh, the Suffolk County Department of Economic Development and Planning, and the Michael and Ronnie Cosell Foundation. Um, and uh, if you haven't already, please come visit this show. It is not to be believed, not to be missed. And here to explain a little bit about what we are looking, what you would be looking at if you were in person in the gallery is Darlene. Uh, take it away, Darlene. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ned. I hope, can everyone hear me? We're trying with microphones and shared space, but virtual as well, okay. Um, so I hope you will get a chance to visit the gallery in person, but if not, we're also going to try to run through some of it today and give a little tour and give a bit of background to what you would be seeing if you entered the gallery, um, what kind of this whole thing started with. So actually, Kate is going to start out with a few images. And because the works are, it's called Evolving Perceptions, but we've done sort of a retrospective of my work for the last, since 1995. And it all kind of runs through, but it has evolved over time. And what you're looking at first here is when I first began using nails. And a lot of people ask why I use the nails at all. And it was a just a, very interesting way for me to uh, start to make a tangible text. So the first idea was what you're seeing here, what I could use to write a letter to the universe. And I wanted it to be tactile like Braille. And I tried many different things like sewing or adding, gluing objects to canvas and over time, I tried out hammering nails into wood. These are two by fours with metal sheeting over it. Um, and I wrote this to the universe. So to whom it may concern from the artist and all humanity. <laughs> so this was written in different languages. I tried to glean a little bit from as many different characters and texts as I could and there was no possible grammar that I could use. It was more about the feeling or the urgency or the asking. So just the effort of doing it was what I was reaching for. And it, it felt right. I, I worked on this for a long time and hammering the nail out had a different sense to me. It was also this sound wave that rippled out from a point. And so I was asking questions about humanity and where we were going and what we could use help with and how we could use help. And this was something that I knew I would continue on. So from that, I went to the next is I did a series of letters that are from the artist to whom it may concern. And I kept with that idea of writing out questions. And it felt very helpful for me 
And it just felt like a, a very beautiful way of transmitting this kind of sending out. Bit by bit, I developed this as a code. It's not all different languages. It's what I would be using in English to write. I started a book of hope. And the, these are pages that are, each one has kind of visualizations and prayers for humanity over the following years. And I did many, many of these pages every few years. Um, and then I will show you, I have, I was trying to see if I can, I'm gonna walk through the gallery because we have samples of most things here. We have a very early piece. This is called review. And this is one of them where I am using the code in nails. So it's a tangible text. And if you see here, I can actually give you a different kind of energy. Okay, so it's the size and sequence I would be using in English. And then everything is written out in this way. And I did this for a while um, until I also realized that every time I was hammering out each letter of the sentence, I was holding the whole sentence in my mind. So it was redundant. It was, it's visual and you can see it, but I didn't need to do it. <laughs> so what happened, I wanted to make it a little bit more fluid. So if you come into the gallery, you'll see <laughs> this one is back here. This is an example of a prayers piece. Um, and I've done this in all sizes from very small, that I've gifted to five foot by five foot with thousands of these where one nail is the um, prayer. One is one sentence. So everything is condensed. And this is kind of the idea of the whole show as well, or my work, that it's condensing information and then re-sensing it in aggregate and then going back into each. So knowing that each has meaning and yet feeling for the larger meaning. And these I love to touch as well. <laughs> so if we go to the next picture, Kate has number four. So this shows after a while, I knew I didn't have to show it so linearly and methodical, although I love doing that. I also could continue to write, but have them become whatever they wanted to become. So they started kind of, instead of starting left to right at the top, I started moving things around and, and kind of letting the nails build what I started to feel as weaves, tapestries, maps. Um, this one is called empathetic civilization. So I was thinking of the aggregate of us all. And then if you go to number five, that's kind of a detail of when the pieces, you would see they were hammered in and now I add these layers of glue and kind of tactile sculptural um, textures to have it be a little bit softer. It's not important to me that they are nails. <laughs> it's just that the nail is one tactile piece. So it's a counting and something that you can touch. So now in this, I have, we have examples in the, gallery of pieces like this. So if you would see it like this, you're almost getting a, a map or an organism or a weave. And I have, and again, these will range anywhere from one foot to five feet. 
of just aggregates of the nails as they would like to be. And sometimes they feel like they tell me stories after. If each of these is a person <laughs> or a world, then this is almost a calling. This one's called Prayer Weave with Telephone. So tactile with that. And now if you see through those pieces, there are the points which when they were sentences were the end piece, the period of a sentence would kind of become its own little world. And from there, I loved to think of those as spaces where you could look into that world, jump into that world, see it. And if it was showing me something new or a vision, or if it was showing me a different place on this planet, I would zoom into it and then we can go into that one image of number six. So this is the perception series and evolving perceptions is what we are calling the show. So there are many, many examples of these pieces here. But as you see, it's this aggregation of all of these points within, and they are to me just listening to, feeling, smelling, sensing all of this in aggregate. This particular one is called Bedtime Story of the Sea. And when I'm making some of these, it will be almost trying to feel out a certain moment and a certain sense. So this would be as much as you can think of you're standing at the ocean, you're breathing in that air, but then where is that from? What is making up that air and that sensation that you are feeling right then? And each one is just for me like something to be in wonder about. So whether you're <laughs> looking at or a little bit of even a waft of suntan lotion, uh, a tiny bit of brine. Go to um, the website. I'm on. What's it. that? <laughs> I've got those. I couldn't hear if there was a question there. Um, this is a new piece, so evolving determination. Some of them are moods as well. So it's kind of sensing out. I've created ones where I'm remembering a feeling and then trying to re-piece together. Almost like a, a perfumist would make a perfume about a certain thing. This is also a new piece. Perception verdant. This is everything <laughs> enjoying the spring out by where I am now. Just all the light, the color, the smell, the bits of buds. And um, I get overwhelmed <laughs> and also in love with it all. And each one is its own little world. Let's see if we can zoom in enough. Here we go. But there are details within each. And I invite you, if you do make it to the show, you'll see all these have different things of cedar <laughs> delight. To take a photograph of one nail head because the idea also is looking closer first and then zooming out again and thinking of each of these as worlds of their own. So whether they are spots on the globe or scent, 
droplets of water. They each have this information and then the outer. As if we could show number seven. Oh, you did. Yeah. If anyone is on Instagram, I started a little hashtag just to collect. These are some of my okay, photographs thanks. of the details. Some favorite ones because you can really see how they are little worlds within and you can search for them. I have large pieces that it's called search for you. So you would be looking through myriads of whether it be planets or <laughs> points until you find something. And then number eight. So for me, these were also ways of seeing. Inside each, I was starting to kind of feel out different things that were happening, whether I felt it was zooming in or out, zooming into where we live from above or zooming further in as a microscope into a leaf and zooming back out again. I was looking at how we interact as human beings and things that are happening over time, a long period of time. What are the cycles we are a part of? What symbiosis are we in a stage of? This is one piece in the gallery. It's also kind of seeing us as part of a neural network or thinking of our cells transmitting, communicating. And I have many that are like Petri dishes Yes, we could go to the next image, number nine. And this is Petri Playgrounds. Again, it's, it's almost as you're seeing those little worlds within the nail heads for me, <laughs> but now seeing us interacting, each of those are little houses, little pools and reaction rings. And I like to think of us as part of this larger organism reacting in different ways and changing over time, but that we are only able to see a few years <laughs> in that space. But people that watch through a microscope, let's see, can see a larger or see time sped up in a different way and see reactions. So I always wonder where we are in time. And the next image is just a close up of that sort of thing. So what I was saying, seeing us within. And then here in the gallery, there are several from showing that aspect of thinking of us as part of a larger organism. And they're layered pieces, so I like to give a fluid feeling. This is Bloom Colony, Pond View Estates. <laughs> I'm thinking of shelf fungus and our habitats. <laughs> and the Pine Barrens, the aquifer, a lot of things to ponder what we are doing as a species and how we are behaving on top of the planet <laughs> and what it looks like as you zoom back in. So this one is called fingerprint and it's zooming back into the human body, which is another layer of multiple species working together as one somehow.
And these I went on into mappings of familiar places. So again, like I'm looking at a Petri dish. But this is Riverhead Ariel, and we as points and cells within this moving. And through imaginary realms of mapping, thinking about spaces in general as they fold in on themselves or expand. That's autocatalytic spaces. So a space that expands for what is needed. <laughs> Love thinking of that. Another specific space in Southampton. <laughs> And then again, we'll end up with these are imaginary realms, but thinking about spaces in general and memory. So each of these places have embedded layers of history, of course, and things that we individually learn or know. And I would love, I always try to contemplate these as transferable crystal-like thought forms and places you can inhabit and you can share with others. So a lot of these pieces are about sharing and storing memory. It's about the memory of plants, storage and learning. This one is called Epic Tale of an Idea. And it is from many years of Kind of a vision unfolding and the idea of sharing information across. And their sculptural pieces, very 3D. Safety archive, how we are <laughs> storing, archiving, or how we do protect our information. A lot of these pieces I use as storage. Online, I have embedded files. <laughs> this is soft landing. So aggregates of these memory palaces, as I call it, which you can land onto a place to hold. And there are many, many little baby pieces. We did a lot of different scales here. But this is islands and other experiments and lots of series. I love doing almost miniature works, but they're very layered. And I think we've kind of covered all the gallery. Yeah, so I'm going to come back to the center. And we have, if you have a few more images, So that one is the epic tale. That one again online has memory embedded as she mouses over, you'll see the information is there. But it's more that each piece is something that can hold. It's the idea of these points as memory points. And I do do some workshops where it's memory mapping and you create your own work where you are having a space of your memory and you place your memories within in those points so that you can retrieve them tactically and as a storyboard. This is a piece called the practice circuit and it's sort of something I'm working also forward on next projects. Um, but the idea of those memory palaces as navigable and something I'd like to see larger. I will be doing a larger scale sculpture this summer as part of a project for the Parish Museum Roadshow. The idea that we are all interconnected. This is sort of the larger 
picture back out, but seeing all of these points of information of data and of us as completely threads intertwined and what we can maybe glean from that, seeing it in as the last piece shows. Oh, I guess number 17, yeah. This island network. And then part of the vision that is behind all of this is that interconnection, but also in being able to help throughout the world as we are one body. So we are constantly able to pulse and nourish throughout what we would like um, to help with. And we are interconnected. So there's a sort of organism that I'm feeling for to remind myself that this is growing and it's messy and it's something just like nature that continues to stretch and become something we are only about to see. This piece is called synthesis. Okay, I know that was very long, <laughs> possibly, but I'd love to hear questions. Charlene, thank you very much. That was tremendous. Um, okay, I, I don't know if we're gonna be able to hear you as well, but my, my question for you was um, early on when you were describing um, your early work, like when you were talking about the review piece, but also the, you know, when you were cr creating a, a language um, in a more linear style, you said that as you were you know, uh, evolving that process um, and that way of expression that you had kind of, I believe you said something to the effect that there was no longer a grammar, that, that the grammar had sort of like you had taken that out of it. Um, and so I guess my question is, you know, one of the challenges of looking at your work um, and trying to, you know, dive into all of these concepts is that um, there is this um, either loose grammar or, you know, you have created your own grammar for um, how you uh, express those all of the ideas about scale and about worlds and mapping and memory. And so I guess my question is, you know, what, what might be, if, if you were to write out a grammar, what would it start with? And what would be the, the um, most important aspect of it? Hmm. Well, I think when I was saying about grammar, it was the beginning of the letter so yeah. utilizing the different languages, I could not make a grammar work. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went from there kind of back to using only English so I could use that sequence and it would feel more fluid for me, but also taking it away from a visibility ability of characters. So now it is more abstract as a form. And again, I'm hoping that people can feel it instead of reading, which in the first piece, you could read sections of it. Right. Um, but if you mean the overall grammar of my entire work, more like more like the different series, like it seems like there is a a, an individual grammar to each series. Um, you know, like for instance, the, um, the, the last section, the last um, grouping, there were the, the architectural forms that, that are in them. Um, that seems to be sort of consistent throughout that one series. Um, it seems as though there has to be some sort of a grammar or how you conceive of um, each particular series. And I guess I, my question was, you know, do you need a grammar 
at some point so that there is, you know, a way to, to express um, the individual ideas um, and, you know, what, how do you come up with that grammar, I guess? If I'm understanding correctly, I, I'm hoping that that might be something of the synthesis that is retroactive, something that comes of understanding the different um, series. As I'm continuing to add to them, they aren't linear. So I have these kind of categories of my work in some ways, but different years, I will start to meld them as well. So in a way, if I'm writing one long thing in my life, I am not doing it in linear form. I'm going back to the first sentence and adding in a couple of things. Then I'm going to the seventh paragraph and adding in some things. <laughs> okay. Do I hope maybe in the future be able to read it more easily and that may be postpart you know after okay thank you Do we want to open it up to other questions? If anyone else has any questions they would like to ask Darlene? I also wanted to ask about, um, you were talking about, you know, the, early on the, the, um, the, the early work that you talked about was called the Book of Hope, is that right? Mm -hmm. Is there a, a hopefulness throughout all of the work to this day? Yes, there's a very determined hopefulness. Um, I love actually the term radical optimism. <laughs> and despite what may seem is happening and a lot of the darkness that we walk through and the confusion it is seeing that thread of those things that add up together that are showing there is something evolving that feels similar to what I've seen in dreams. I feel like I've had a dream showing something as a very positive um, future state and I don't see necessarily how we're getting there, but almost looking backwards from there, there is a way we're going to get there. And I do look for that in what is happening every year. And I feel that there will be something that adds up and we'll understand it. Good. I know. No, it keeps me going. Okay, uh, we have a, one question from uh, Nancy and Gail. All right, Nancy and Gail, you can unmute. Yeah, hi. I was interested um, in, first of all, I just want to say we did see the exhibit. Oh, um, okay. And you have to go if anybody who hasn't gone in there you must go see it it is just spectacular and beautiful and evocative it was one of the most be beautiful exhibits i've ever seen there i, I just lo loved it loved it loved it mm. so thank you um, <laughs> and and also the difference um between it's the nails are the connecting theme but there's such a different feel um, for the ones where, I don't know if it's enamel or whatever it is that you put on the end of the, um, nails, those ones with the painting in the back are so different than the all nail ones, both just incredible. But, um, enough said, uh, my question, I had a couple of little questions if I can remember now. One, when I was there, I wondered this and it, uh, watching your presentation made me remember it. I think you called it Riverhead, the round one. Mm -hmm. I wondered 
how you came to the decision to make the edges not even. You know, that it's... Um, like this? It, that it... No, it, it's circular, but it's, you know, the, the, it's not smooth, the right. circle on the outside. And I wondered how you decided that. It's part of my process. I'm not trying to make it an almost machine made piece. It, it is very hand done. This is aspects that are kind of put with tape as I'm putting the layers in. And that's how with each layer, it follows a curve a little bit more. So it makes it a little bit more organic. And I, I like that it almost becomes yeah. Yeah, really good. I liked it too, but I, I just, just was curious because the other edges are smoother. They're they're not not perfect, perfectly squared, but they're smoother. I thought with the round piece, it happens, which is interesting to me too. It's sort of seeing a curve, yeah, and something that would be a slight maybe imperfection is modeled becomes more um emphasized over time yeah. so i love also thinking like imagine if i took it many many layers further would it become a different shape mm -hmm. and i love thinking of aggregate biological forms like shells and how they form with the amplification of a difference so you have this this coil and you have this little bit, but as it goes further in larger increments, it becomes this form, this spiral form that expands into large and then goes into small. It's, it's just fascinating to me. But it's not completely intentional with this. It's more the handmade element of making these pieces. But there's a choice implicit in that because you right. certainly could have, you know. Yeah, I haven't taken it out. Circle, you know. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy and Gail. Did you have any other questions? I can't remember. All right, feel free to jump back in if you think of something. Thanks. Thank right. you. And do we have other, other questions? Everyone has the ability to unmute if you'd like to jump in to say anything to the artist. I, 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 oh, go ahead. I wasn't entirely clear about how you, is it, what's on the ends of the nails? Is it enamel? How does it get there? It's the same material I'm using coating the whole piece. So everything is painted first. Uh, the enamel, there's some of the nail heads I'm using different enamels on or different paints. You might even see bits of glitter or, or fragments of things within. Then it's coated in the clear resin, which the whole piece has. But when I put it onto a nail head carefully like this, it creates a dome. And in that, I loved that feeling of it's, it's this little world that you can peer oh, yeah. into. Yeah. And that's, again, something of surface tension, physics, and nature, just like a water droplet on top, and it creates that shape. Um, and what you're seeing in the rest of the pieces is also that clear layer. So it's painted first, and then it's a crystal clear layers. And sometimes I'm painting or drawing in between the layers so you get that depth, like um, the balloon colony space like on this side. Yeah. <laughs> so that one that she's showing has many layers drawn in the clear. And other ones have ink or, or something else to show it. The 
do we, do we have other other questions or comments from visitors? I guess I uh, wanted to. Um, I did have a question, but then I, I lost it. Um, we were talking earlier, Carlene, about um, the size of, of your works, that they are always, you know, a, a foot, two feet, three feet, four feet square. And I was wondering if you could uh, share with us why that is. Sure. Um, like I was saying, some in some ways, it's just simplifying things for myself. Um, in others, I love the idea of scale shifting. So keeping in mind that we can look at these pieces as being minuscule in a way, but entering into them so that they're larger than what we are or then expanding it, I like to work larger as well. And I'd like to expand it further. There's a short film that I was telling you about called Powers of 10. That's a very classic film by Eames, Charles Eames, that shows our world from the universe going by powers of 10 down to the earth, to a blanket with a couple laying out on a picnic blanket, and then into the very hand and down into the cells, the DNA and the spaces that arise within there with empty space until you're in the quantum realm again, and which looks exactly like the outer. <laughs> galaxies and universe. So I'm also playing with scale in virtual worlds. I don't know if anyone has ever explored these <laughs> where you can be within a digital realm that is any space. So right now we're in one, of course, we're sharing all of these multiple spaces. Um, but you, I can within the this virtual world, I can kind of create a sculpture that you can navigate in as a avatar form and get it a feel in that way. And it's not just an experiment visually because I can navigate one of these realms with friends and people that I know that are in different parts of the world at once and we enter into one space and then we are entering into a form. So another way to understand even mathematical entities or uh, dwellings, architectures, spaces. When you talk about worlds and that, you know, that and, and different scale that you know, as you as you go in, as you kind of zoom in and zoom out, you know, it, it seems like when when we think about worlds, or at least when I think about worlds, we see them as as um, in the round. And I do do you have a do you feel sort of challenged by creating works that are, I mean, they're not necessarily two dimensional, but they are flat works. Um, is that a challenge for you in thinking through some of the concepts that you're kind of wrangling with? Yeah. Something that is two dimensional? <laughs> it has been. Um, I never really felt satisfied with creating anything two dimensional. Um, and I started with sculpture, I wanted it to be tangible, but now. Even as I explore all these different concepts, it's it's important to me almost to layer and embed them within each other. So taking one aspect and condensing that information and having it be within another piece that shows it from another level. So there may end up being 
some sort of animation or film that I play with later too that can pull you through from one to the next. So you feel that fluidity. That might be also nice because it's something I do or feel when I'm working with these different series. But it would be nice to be able to um, bring people through it in that way as well. I'm hoping some of what I'm going to be working on this summer might help in that way. Yeah. I, I had another question. Um, I wondered what was the substance you used to, that you said something with the Parish Art Museum. What did, what did you use to connect the different nails? Okay, it wasn't, that piece wasn't for the Parish Museum. I'm oh, okay. saying that, that I'll be working with these different scale sculptures, mm -hmm. but I was using monofilament to connect okay. the nail heads. Um, in various pieces, I wanted to show that as a weaving of us together and network. So I did a lot of pieces that were with the nails connected and looking at us as part of those networks is fascinating. So we are in a stage I feel and hope, again, this is the hopeful <laughs> charge in a lot of my work that we are feeling out and growing support networks throughout this globe. And even in this pandemic time, it was an exercise in figuring out a big challenge of how to stay connected when we could not be in the same space. And that challenge was really unforeseen. We knew that we were growing that, but we didn't have this sort of overwhelming global point where that was the priority. How do you maintain connection and how do you help where it's needed multiples of people that need to stay separate? So looking at networks and looking at support and how we can connect when separated by space. It's a challenge we are growing into. And where does time, oh, by the way, I, um, I posted, or I put the um, project with the parish uh, in the chat box if anyone is interested. Um, the information is there, the symbiosome uh, project that is coming up next. And that's in, did you say it's in August? It really? starts in August and goes on till October. And that'll be out in Orient, where I'm an artist in residence, but also we'll have um, virtual aspects to it as well, to connect you to a space. It's actually going to be inside of a schoolhouse which I love as a structure of memory and the idea of thought forms walking into a space. Okay, I believe uh, Nancy and Gail have a question. I'm, I'm sorry to just keep asking more questions, but um, <laughs> I, was, I was also wondering if you could say more. At one point you took your mouse and you went over different parts of the piece and you said that you embedded information. Is that some if information, something that people who look at your photos of stuff online can access or is that your information or, or is it's, that what you were talking about where you connected with people all over the world? I wasn't clear about that. Right. It, um, I almost wasn't gonna mention it. It's just another layer. Um, it's not that easily accessible. It's in my, organizational format in Flickr, which I also see as part of, I, I have a large piece that's called Self Archiving Library Temple. And these are thinking of how information is organized, organized over time and archived 
and tagged and how that creates another cluster of information. So if you were to go to my Flickr, um, those particular pieces, and maybe we could put a, a link or we'll figure, um, you can mouse over certain ones and I have my notes in there. Um, but it's also to kind of show it like this as that is the ability to do that. Each piece could be a memory board and you can rewrite it as well. Like I would say, if you had a piece at home that was mine, it doesn't need to have my information within it. It does in a layer, but it can be your memory palace, your points of anything that you would like to place within those areas or memory boards. These, Underneath that one, it actually says some about that, about it being a palimpsest. Thanks. <laughs> and these can actually be clicked through. Correct? Yeah, like I put information that I, I am fascinated by that has something to do with. The... Hey, can you drop the um, that link in the chat box? Yes, I can. And it won't, unfortunately, work on your phone. <laughs> it seems not that way. But on desktop, it should work. So my my question from before was, um, you know, where where does time fit into this? I mean, you you talked about, you know, the you talk about bodies. You talk about um, you know, body is metaphor in different worlds, but is that, you know, bodies that live now or bodies that live in the past? Is there, you know, a differentiation there? Or is that kind of irrelevant to the, to the discussion here? It's relevant in that I love thinking about us as an emerging and evolving organism. And with the us, it would be all of humanity and other species over long periods of time. So evolution and with the time period now, let's say if we were looking at, many people have used this metaphor, which I love, the caterpillar and the butterfly and that the pandemic part is this mush of dissolving. Um, there are cells within that are called imaginal cells, beautiful name, but they really hold the information. Even when the caterpillar has dissolved all of its recognizable form, the information is there and it continues to evolve new structures things like wings, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's in there. So if I think of us through time, what are we evolving? What is possible as we look decades, centuries forward, since we didn't have a lot of the things that we have now of ways of communicating across distance instantly, the way that organisms as they're forming, the brain forming has to evolve these connections over a certain amount of time. Hi, uh, Darlene, can you hear me? I can. Oh, okay. I was having a little bit of technical difficulties here. <laughs> um, uh, I can't wait to get down to see the exhibition and um, it's been so exciting to see your work over the past 10 years. I think um, it was at our site. <laughs> I, I just, I, I was like, who is that speaking? I don't know. Yeah, it's Pam Brown. You know. Hello, Pam. I don't know. Oh. I'm having a tough time. I, my computer doesn't have a, um, 
a screen, um, a camera built in. So I have a portable one. But anyway, um, it's just been exciting to see your work grow and, and, and sort of evolve. And uh, I just love the technique and the skill and the ability and, and the repetition and, and just the whole studio practice. I mean, in addition to all that, you know, conceptually, um, it, it's just the way you pull it all together. It's, it's it's really you know um incredibly uh successful and beautiful on on so many different levels but um just out of curiosity the project that you're going to do with the parish i mean you you talked about sculpture because as a sculptor when i look at your work i mean i think it's incredibly sculptural and um you know as as someone who also does relief i'm just sort of curious Will it come off the wall? Will it come onto the floor? Will some of these architectural structures sort of evolve in a different kind of space, whether they're suspended or, you know, off the ground? Yeah. What are your I, thoughts um, about that? <laughs> I've been playing with um, doing a few more freestanding sculptures, so things that you can walk around mm -hmm. or handheld. Mm -hmm. Because so instead of it having a backing or mm -hmm. a floor, mm -hmm. um, thinking of more of the organic, like I was talking about shells and mm -hmm. very interested in diatoms and thinking of our memory palace structures in that way. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing a few small sculptures that are rounded and then one large piece. Mm -hmm. And then also taking that into the virtual world where you can enter into oh, yeah. oh, very the sculptures cool. because uh -huh. I want you to see them as the rooms or uh, uh -huh. that I, I see it as when I'm placing them together. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Oh, that will be, well, that will be very cool. But anyway, I, I can't wait to get down to the show and I'm sort of glad I figured out my technical problems here. Oh, please, and I can it's see so you. It's so nice Hello. to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you too. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I can't wait to get down. It has to do with libraries too. I love like just seeing the books behind you. Oh, I'm, I'm down I'm in my to condense. Like dungeon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, any spaces with knowledge around them. So mm -hmm. I'm miniaturizing that and then trying to expand them. So working with libraries. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah. it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. And, and some of the pieces where there's a lot more negative space around and, and the irregular shapes and all of that, you know, because I think when I first saw the work, uh, um, it was more maps at art sites and I've been paying attention off and on for years you know so I've always been keeping up uh, on your work. Um, well, this will have a mixture of things too at, yeah. at the parish but I am excited to kind of experiment with actualizing some of these which I've had in sketches for years and years uh -huh. but now to actually take it into that realm and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, with challenges, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> so. Uh huh. Well, that will be exciting. Now, and I and you probably already answered this. You're in a residency right now. Yes. And where is that? Out in Orient Point. Orient Point. So it's a very, very amazing. I'm so grateful for this. So it's a long-term visit residency. It's called the William Steeple Davis House. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And he's an artist who, who dedicated his home. It's a historic home that he lived in his whole life. Mm -hmm. uh, and he put it into his will and his trust for an artist to be selected every year mm -hmm. to live and work there. And uh -huh. it's such a quiet and inspiring, beautiful, natural place. So I, I've been living there and inspired by the layers of history Mm -hmm. works that are um, that will also be in the show there too but mm -hmm. beating the house so uh -huh. beating the layers of time and family that live there mm -hmm. that's kind of interpreted in my nail <laughs> mm -hmm. 
as, as yeah, and I love that complexity of layering, you know, and even I'm, I do a lot of layering in my own work, but even mm -hmm. though it's not always obvious or evident, you know, you, you get that sense um, from your work. I mean, and, and I don't mean it's dense, it, it's, it, it's dense, but it visually doesn't look dense. It has a, you know, um, a movement and, and a lightness to it. And, and I love the clear coding and that, that depth of, of field there, even though it's like maybe just in some areas only an inch, but within that inch, there's just a lot of information. And to me, that's what's, you know, exciting about your work is, you know, um, you know, is that dialogue. And that's something that I always ask whenever, you know, what are all those layers? But, you know, so anyway, right. but it's very exciting. And I'm so glad that you have this residency. How much longer is it for the rest of the year? Yeah, October. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. No, very exciting. I hope to get out to visit. Please do. It's beautiful. Yeah. And then the show will be over there nearby, right in the village. Okay. Cool house. So. Oh, well, very August, good. So maybe you can come during that time. Yeah. Well, I would love to. I'd love to. I'm seeing Claire Watson at some point next week. Oh, so okay. anyway, yes. so, <laughs> but, um, but it would be, it, you know, congratulations. Thank you so much. Wonderful to see you. Yep. You too. You too. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Okay. All right. Do we have any other questions? I, I actually had one more. This is Nancy again. Sure. Um, I, I just was curious if there's any chance you allow visitors to your studio because we have a place in Orient. We're headed there tomorrow and oh. uh, I'm over the long weekend. We would love to see what you do, but I certainly understand if you prefer not to. Have well, people. let's exchange information or I will afterwards and then we can okay. arrange a time. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank Darlene, you, Nathan. Darlene. I just went down the rabbit hole of your um, me memory archive, the the one piece that we were looking at on, on Flickr, um, and oh. <laughs> I got I got lost a little bit. But um, so there was one that um, opened onto a scene of three three bodies that are kind of standing in underground space. What what is that? Oh, I think you hit into the Center for Water Studies in a Virtual World. Was it almost animated? Yeah, well, it's not moving. Well, it's well uh, meaning uh, cartoon yeah. versions of people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is in, in the virtual worlds that I was explaining. There are different educational realms, people that I know are taking their work and making it, if they're educators, scientists, making realms that you can explore in the way of, if you're talking about water studies, you're walking into this memory palace, you're walking underwater. And as you click on this object, more information can open up. You can read information in three dimensions. And that's been always something I'm interested in immersing into information spaces. And so now I've been back in there and, and with librarians who create book clubs for every book is a different realm you can sit in for a meeting mm -hmm. that is based on that <laughs> book or series. Um, and for me, I have an evolving vision of showing it with navigating nonprofits. So a lot of my work, well, all of my work is part of the larger vision that if it sells, it's distributed 10% uh, to a list and collection of nonprofits that are working towards these things that I'm feeling we need as a world, as a globe, that are helping compassionately throughout the world. So I'm interested to see more of this three-dimensional library 
of the projects that I've collected and connected to, all the people that are doing this work, um, and being able to be in that space almost as a natural form with the information around you and the ability to do something. Any small thing that in aggregate is creating cascades of change. It seems like a, a natural um, progression or a natural atmosphere to connect with your work because of the, the kind of layers of dimensional experiences that you have just in, in the pieces themselves, but adding that layer of, of the, um, the internet and the connection in a digital realm seems to be a, a really great avenue because it, you found it um, helpful for that kind of information storage and do you, and you said like others will layer their own like points or you would like them to? I think it's just another whole realm that exists that we are, we're learning to navigate back and forth. It's challenging as an organism to be able to be hybrid in that way for myself, definitely. I'm usually in one space or another. I'm not a multitasker in, <laughs> on the phone and seven different things, but we have the ability to connect and collaborate over distance. Right now, each person that is connected here is in a different space. We're having one conversation. And a lot of my work is also looking at that from above. I call it conversations in space time. So right now, if I was making a piece visualizing each of you where you are that monofilament connecting us that's somewhat of a natural form that is temporal but is always connected and more so now that we've had this event together i am sort of traced or there's a resonance again for that structure that continues. And then I like to think about all the different conversations that are happening throughout the world that might be of that tone <laughs> or looking over a larger field, especially if there are things about trying to find hope or actions towards our future collectively looking over a larger space and seeing those points as part of an organism that are kind of vibrating and forming something. So that's inspiring to me. Okay, we have time for oh, let's some see. little chat. Oh. Yeah. Hi, right now. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> so, do you have any other questions, comments? Nancy has a question. Nancy, do you have another question? Okay. Let's see. Well, if there are no other questions. Um, well, I want to nice say something. This sure. is not a question. It's a comment. So um, I had a conflict about what to do tonight and I chose this and it was so the right decision. I, I feel like my whole world and my brain and everything has whew, kind of shifted. I'm just so impressed with how you speak about your work. Even if you didn't have, I haven't seen the show yet. But just listening to this talk has, has been a work of art that has, has moved me so much. Um, I don't know who you are. I'm going to, I'm going to research everything about you <laughs> now that afterwards. And definitely come see the show. This is amazing. How did you find this artist, Kate and Ned? Thank you. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. We look forward to seeing you in the gallery soon. <laughs> We're going to show this tonight, too. What, yeah. what did you say, Ned? We're glad that you chose us tonight too for your no. <laughs> This is beautiful in that I this space I is a memory palace for me as well. I grew up not so far away in Ronkonkoma. And so I've been to this space over years with my parents. <laughs> and it's so wonderful to return here and be able to share all of this work of my lifetime uh, in this space again. And it's an 1800s farmhouse. So similar to where I'm living right now, I feel layers of history in it and then very personal layers of history as well and moments, slices in a way that I see clearly because I was embodied in it. <laughs> Um, I'm just very grateful I was invited back here to uh, do this show with you all. Well, we welcome you back. Very excited to have the work here. And, and really we also cool. welcome you all to come visit the show. Um, it's up for more than an, another month, even longer than a month. It uh, goes until July 4th, just about. Um, and um, yeah, come come see the work and come visit us. Um, we also have some great events coming up. Next month is going to be jam packed with uh, the Wet Paint Festival and Makers Markets, all sorts of things. Um, so um, thank you, Darlene, for joining us tonight and sharing us, sharing with us uh, your work and uh, your world. Um, thank you all for joining us. And once again, I need to thank our sponsors, Dime Bank, uh, Suffolk County Department of Economic uh, Development and Planning and the Cosell Foundation. Um, and if you have any other questions, um, just reach out to us, but come see us in person. Pretty soon we'll be able to see one another face-to-face. -face. Uh, not quite yet, but soon. So um, you all take care and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank you so much.